My name is Nema Tajiboy and I am the Chief of Nutrition for UNICEF here live in Nigeria. I've had the privilege previously of working for two fantastic foundations and I'm absolutely delighted to be moderating today's event. We're going to hear exciting commitments and I mean truly, truly exciting from a variety of organizations who are pledging to play their part in changing the narrative of nutrition in service of SDG 2, Zero Hunger. Today's event is organized by Stronger Foundations for Nutrition, which is a coalition of private foundations committed to ending malnutrition worldwide. While the genesis of Stronger Foundations for Nutrition began in 2017, the brand Stronger Foundations for Nutrition is hot off the press, barely three weeks old, and it's an honor to be part of their public launch. So thank you all for joining. If this was a live, uh, if we were live in a, a room or conference room, we'd all provide a round of applause, but I'd like you to pick up a cup of whatever you have, water, coffee, a glass of wine, and toast to Stronger Foundations for Nutrition. And again, thank you all for joining. Um, for those of you who know me, you won't be surprised to hear that I absolutely love the name Stronger Foundations for Nutrition. First, because when we deliver good nutrition, we lay strong foundations for all of our work across global health and development. And second, when foundations come together as a community, it makes their collective voice and investment stronger and more transformational. I'm sure you're eager to get to today's events, but let me take you back a little in time. About a decade ago, at the original Nutrition for Growth Summit in 2013, only two foundations, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, participated. Fast forward to 2017 at the Nutrition Summit in Milan, we had six additional foundations pledge ambitious commitments uh, to the tune of about $350 million. Today, we will witness more than a dozen uh, private organizations make commitments to investing in nutrition. And I've been told that over this past year of Nutrition for Action, more than a billion US dollars have been pledged through 2025. So again, a round of applause for those, for those commitments. While this may seem like a drop in the ocean, these commitments are exciting, partly because funding from foundations is usually nimble and catalytic. And foundations can take risks, such as investing in evidence generation for acceleration at scale, which other donors cannot. And secondly, these commitments are powerful, not just for their own impact, but also because of what they signify. At a moment in time when climate change and a global pandemic is taking us further away from good health and prosperity, um, are pushing us away from good health and prosperity, a diverse and dynamic community is coming together to drive momentum and bring hope that change is possible. So I'm sure you're eager to get to today's events and learn more about these commitments, hear thoughtful keynotes and out of the box financing ideas like game, uh, you know, such as gaming or that leveraging carbon markets could increase investments in nutrition. I didn't know that this was possible, so stay tuned to hear more. Uh, on the logistics side, the event will take about two hours and we will be using various formats, including panels, live and pre-recorded remarks across three thematic themes, food systems, health systems, and innovative models for mobilizing capital at scale. Before we begin, an important logistic note, there is an interpretation button uh, at the bottom of your screen so you can listen in English or in French. So look for it. Um, um, so that you can, you, you can uh, participate in both languages. So without further ado, let us begin. Um, and as our first speaker of the day, I'm very, very pleased to introduce you to Kim Starkey, Chief Executive Officer of King Philanthropies as one of the new foundations to share their exciting commitment. Over to you, Kim, to start us off. If a Martian came down from outer space and took a look at our world, and especially the social sector, he would be perplexed. So many disconnects, things that don't make sense, unnecessary suffering. Malnutrition is especially perplexing. In a world that is full of nutritious food, the Martian would be shocked by the prevalence of hunger and malnutrition. With our new commitment, 
to combating malnutrition, we see an unparalleled opportunity to address some of these disconnects. It's my great honor to announce King Philanthropy's $100 million commitment to fighting food insecurity and malnutrition. While relatively new to the issue, we're coming forward today because we believe there is a moral imperative to fight this battle. The Martian, we're scratching our heads at the disconnect between the size of the problem and the current funding that's directed to address it. Malnutrition is the leading cause of death of children under five, responsible for 45% of deaths. In and yet it receives less than 1% of donor funding. At King Philanthropies, we strive to take a fact-based approach to our giving decisions. Our research and analysis led us to conclude that fighting malnutrition should be seen as a priority investment category for donors. We have many different criteria and fighting malnutrition scores are off the charts on all of them. For example, size of the unmet need, neglect by other donors, tractability and the existence of interventions that are proven to work and especially cost effectiveness. Interventions to prevent and treat malnutrition are considered to be some of the most cost-effective solutions in global health and development. Whether it be micronutrient fortification, vitamin A supplementation, or emergency therapeutic foods, the cost per person is astonishingly low. And yet the resources directed to malnutrition fall far short of the opportunity. The Martian would also be dismayed by the size and speed of the oncoming train that is climate change. We would be shocked by how many of us continue to stand on the tracks despite an ability to slow or even stop the train. Those who will be most affected by climate change are those in extreme poverty who also suffer most from malnutrition. These individuals did the least to cause climate change. But climate change gravely threatens agricultural livelihoods, nutritional status, and food security. Climate change is already pushing more people into extreme poverty, bringing new famines and worsening malnutrition. Slowing and stopping the oncoming train that is climate change will require massive effort and a concerted effort. Almost 20% of climate change is driven by food production. Given that food production is so tightly intertwined with climate, we cannot solve for either without solving for both. Malnutrition is not only a symptom and an effect of poverty, it's also a cause. So that by addressing nutrition, we can help people climb out of poverty. There's a wide body of evidence showing that well-nourished children are more likely to complete school and their future in earnings increase significantly. In the face of these many compelling reasons to fund nutrition, the Martian would astutely observe misallocations and inefficiencies in the social capital market. That is the funding flows in the sector. Many excellent organizations struggle to raise enough funding, and sometimes those that fall short find the funds flowing in. King Philanthropies devotes considerable time and energy to due diligence. We're just getting started, but we've been funding a number of excellent organizations working on the ground with interventions that improve food security and nutritional status, either directly or indirectly. We are so proud to partner with such extraordinary organizations, such as One Acre Fund, Landessa, Last Mile Health, BRAC, Bob and Gona, Sanku, Proximity Designs, and CanFed. And most recently, Particles for Humanity. 
Unfortunately, rigorous due diligence to identify high impact interventions and in organizations is time consuming. And here the Martian would point out an exciting epiphany for donors and prospective new givers. You don't actually have to collect all of the information and do all of the analysis yourself. Information sharing and collaboration among donors is extremely valuable, but far too rare. The Martian would be scratching at his head, looking at all these donors scattered around, working separately and by themselves. Given all of this, the Martian would join me in my enthusiasm for stronger foundations for nutrition. It offers an exciting path for us to join forces. We have a tremendous opportunity to drive real change. As one of the newest members of this philanthropic community for nutrition, I invite all of you to join us, sharing your time, information, resources, so that we can learn together and fight this problem of malnutrition, clearly one of the defining challenges of our time, together. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kim. Thank you very much for King Philanthropy's amazing commitment and for your inspiring call to action for new partners to come forward. I, I agree, if I was a Martian coming to Earth, I would be very, very perplexed with how we are nourishing our young and our vulnerable. And it's not surprising, therefore, that the Food Systems Summit held earlier this year highlighted the importance of transforming our food systems for people and planet. Our first theme for today, therefore, is on the future of food and about building food systems that are truly inclusive, sustainable, and nutritious for all. So three really important words, inclusive, meaning that the most vulnerable, those who have been historically excluded, must, must be included both as participants and beneficiaries of stronger food systems. Uh, sustainable signifies that our food systems should not just thrive climatic uh, change, but must actively contribute to mitigating catastrophic environmental impact. And nutritious, meaning that we need to no longer, I mean, we can no longer afford to think of just about filling bellies, but rather about how and with what we are filling bellies. So with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, our food systems panel with a fireside chat between Sam Cass, US political advisor and investor. Welcome, Sam and Roy Steiner, Senior Vice President of Food at the Rockefeller Foundation. Welcome, Roy. So Sam and Roy, over to you. Uh, hello, uh, great to be here. Um, it's, uh, it's very exciting for me after been working on these issues for so long to see the Stronger Foundations for Nutrition uh, come to life. It's been a, a big missing piece of, of our work and I'm here uh, with Roy who's been a champion of, the, of these issues for for so many years and so honored to be with, with you, man. Um, so just set a little context and then we're gonna get into, you know, a quick discussion. You know, as, as Kim said, and congratulations and thank you for your leadership, Kim, it's amazing. Um, you know, food and agricultural systems are at the core and the root of so many of the fundamental challenges that we face. Uh, it's the cause of half of deaths of all children under five um, it's unbelievable toll on our well-being uh, is seen throughout so many different aspects of, of society. And yet we're only funding less than 1% of all dollars go to it from a philanthropic standpoint. And we're seeing it underfunded on a global basis, not just in philanthropy, but also from governments and the private sector. So we have a huge opportunity here because food and ag um, really sits at some of the most challenging uh, problems that we face. It's a root cause of so many symptoms. It's the foundation of our economy, of our healthcare systems, of our education systems, really in global stability uh, and national security. Um, and yet, you know, we're under unprecedented threat. Climate change is definitely threatening to upend just about all of the progress that we've made. Um, and we see food and agriculture driving 70% of the world's water use, most of the deforestation that we see land degradation, it's all rooted in how we feed ourselves. So that means that we have a big opportunity. 
um, to solve some of the problems uh, just through addressing these fun these fundamentals of our system. Um, so, Roy, want to just get into it. We don't have a lot of time. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, Rockefeller has been focused on these issues for a long time. It'd be a great, just real briefly, from a very high level, help me help us understand. So, what are your priorities in this space, and where do you see your big unlocks uh, going forward? Sure, it's great to be here with you, Sam. Uh, as usual, um, as you know, you know, we've been uh, Rockefeller Foundation has been in this food and agriculture space for over a hundred years, and for much of that, we have actually focused on on productivity improvement. And that continues to be important. But when we took a step back and did this analysis, it was very clear that we need to start paying much more attention to dietary quality. And in fact, you know, in the last year, we've had these two, uh, uh, several reports on true cost accounting. When you take the overall food system, you know, we, we, we uh, in the US, for example, it costs about a trillion dollars we spend on food, but it creates uh, over $2 trillion worth of uh, of costs. And the majority of that is diet related diseases. I mean, our food system is literally killing us, right? And, and it's actually bankrupting the healthcare system because we have uh, forgotten or are not paid attention to improving the dietary quality of all people, especially the vulnerable. So uh, the, the foundation uh, will be committing the largest commitment the Rockefeller Foundation has ever done towards nutrition in the next, in, in Q1. And it's really going to be focused on an, a number of key, key things. Um, the, the first is, you know, we, we, we have to improve the dietary quality of, uh, we'll commit to 20 million people, primarily through improving institutional procurement, like improving the dietary quality of school meals, et cetera. We can make tremendous change, and there's a lot of opportunity to do that. You know, just shifting from refined grains to whole grains, and those sorts of things can can make massive difference. Yep. And then, secondly, uh, um, it's around getting the right kind of data. We still don't measure dietary quality in an effective way globally. We don't know what people are eating, and therefore, it's hard for us to actually improve dietary quality if you don't have that. And we need a global consensus around how to do that, we need to invest in those data systems. And then thirdly, and this is one of my most exciting, is, is we're gonna be launching in March, um, along with a set of partners, the periodic table of food. You know, most food composition tables only cover about 150 biomolecules, yet we know that our food, our, our, our diets have 20,000 plus, so many of them are critical to, to human health through the microbiome, et cetera. And this will be using the latest mass spectrometry and bioinformatics to create probably the most comprehensive database of the thousands of foods that feed humanity and, and really, I think, advance the, the science of nutrition and agriculture and health in, in, in very exciting ways. So those are the, the three impact commitments that we're really excited about and, and very excited that, that us as a foundation is uh, is are really moving into this direction yeah no that that's amazing and i do i do agree with you i think the, the having the basic data and information to understand where to place our dollars how to track the return on investment of those dollars and have some real measurement apparatus has been a huge missing piece and a part of the reason why we have seen such underinvestment um in this space but for those of us who've been in it you see what a dollar invested in a in a young child's nutrition is the best mm -hmm. dollar you could invest in their long term well being and prosperity for society, um, and so I think having that foundation is going to be critical. So thank you so much for your leadership. There's been a lot happening, right? You know, I, I was at COP 21, like banging on yeah. trying to get people to pay attention uh, to food and ag. We just had COP 26. I'd say we made some progress, uh, but still falls way short. Um, we just came out of the UN Food System Summit, which I would argue is a, a starting point, uh, although we have a long way to go. Tell me like what opportunities you're seeing as these issues start to converge, how that's shaping, you know, how you want to make these investments in this intersection sort of a food and climate and what should we be focused on for the next COP in Egypt? Yeah, it's such a great um, uh, question. I was also uh, at, at the COP26 and it was remarkable how um, 
under um, focused uh, the, 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 the yeah. whole event was on food systems, which as you mentioned and, and Kim mentioned, is you know one of the largest contributors to, to um, uh, greenhouse gases and, and global change. So we need we need a lot more attention. We need the world to recognize that actually, if we shift the food system, not only can we have more nourishing food, uh, but we can actually uh, uh, heal heal the environment. Right. The, the fact that we've created this value destroying food system is really a, a matter of choice and we can actually make create a value creating system with changing a, a set of policies redirecting financial flows uh, but we need greater attention and people to recognize how important that is how important nutrition is uh, to to the future that we all want yeah it, it's absolutely true and i think what we are really starting to understand is that the the foundation of uh, human health is deeply correlated and interrelated to the foundation of planetary health and environmental health. They are one in the same. And until we start investing uh, in this system as a holistic comprehensive system, we will always fall short. Our dollars will always be under leverage. And I think that's what I'm seeing starting to emerge here, which is super exciting. So, I mean, having been in it for so long, feels to me, but you tell me, um, that there's a lot of momentum. Just this announcement this morning, I know we got more coming like, how do you feel uh, from a film, particularly on the philanthropic side, where we're at? You know, do we feel like we have the momentum we need? What What else is needed to sort of catalyze more leadership, more dollars flowing into this space? Yeah, uh, well, I think there's momentum. I don't think it's enough. Uh, and, and because the problem is so significant and huge, but I think, you know, it's so much, I actually came out of COP26 more hopeful than I went in there really skeptical. Hmm. And, uh, but I was more hopeful because I mean, this what's happening in the world is so much more than just what governments are doing. There's so many other things that are happening. And, and, and you see, um, you know, communities acting in ways that are incredibly encouraging. So I think that's, um, that's important. We need, we, we need a lot more. We need people to see things from a system uh, level. And, you know, we're all struggling with that as a, as a global worldwide community. I mean, COVID is a great example of, you know, we really kind of failed in terms of being able to really uh, uh, work together. And I think the nutrition uh, and food and food system is going to require even greater levels of collaboration and cooperation because everything is so interconnected and, and, and recognizing that and building systems that can move us forward is critical yeah i'll just uh, thank you for that and I, I couldn't agree with you more I, i'll just end by saying we're out of time I w we could sit here and talk about this stuff for hours i, I will just say that um you know what what feels to me that's emerging kind of to your point is not just these opportunities to sort of stop these sort of very negative parts of society that feels bad like malnutrition and feels like just that we have a moral imperative which is of course true but when we step back and see the opportunity from a bigger perspective around nutrient density, technology innovation that's bringing incredible solutions to bear, as well as the role that food and ag can play, not just in mitigating our impact on climate, of course, as you know, the number two driver of emissions globally, but actually being, I think, our only hope of solving climate change, or at least giving ourselves a chance over the next decade to bring on other technologies. It is our only shot. It is our only scalable shot. Um, and if we do that and we focus on those systems, both from an environmental standpoint and a human standpoint, we could come out so far ahead of where we are today, let alone just trying to mitigate some of the crazy challenges that we still face. The opportunity is there. I just implore everybody, I'm going to just have a shameless pitch to all those who are watching. This is the best investment you can make. Uh, please stretch yourself, push yourself, just like King Philanthropies did. This is this is the moment i got two young kids if we don't make massive investments that feel really uncomfortable we're going to fall short um and we're not going to meet the moment and we're going to have to tell our kids why we didn't meet the moment so there's no better place to put dollars to work we're going to see outcomes at all levels of society all over the globe so just thank thank you roy and the rockefeller foundation for your leadership thank you you know for pulling this helping to lead and pull this group together i think it's it's incredible so Look forward to the rest of the day's panels and wish we had 
wish we had a lot more time. Great, thanks, Sam. Well, thank you both. Um, Roy, thank you for the Rockefeller's bold and inspiring um, commitment to improving diet quality. With your permission, I'm gonna quote you for the next year, I think, that the food system is killing us and bankrupting the health system. It's a powerful statement. Um, and it kind of, you also said we need to heal the world. So it, it really reminds me of the song, you know, heal the world and let's heal the world by transforming the food system. Sam, thank you for your call to action to scale up investments in support of a world where food production, nutrition, and the environment are so inextricably linked for human and planetary health. So thank you both very much for being with us today. Uh, continuing with this theme, we have a roundup of our next uh, set of speakers to share their commitments and contributions towards those three important words, inclusive, sustainable, and nutritious food systems. So let's hear from Michael Misiko, the Director for Agriculture for Africa, the Nature Conservancy. Then we'll hear from Yelma van der Mortel, Head of ACON at Rabobank. Jimmy Betcher, Head of Partnerships at Partners in Food Solutions. And we will end with Lawrence Haddad, Executive Director at GAIN, who will provide concluding remarks. Over to you, Michael. Thank you so much. Um, do you hear me? Very well, Michael, go ahead. Thank you so much, yeah. Um, thank you for the introduction. And I, um, as you heard, my name is Michael. I work for the Nature Conservancy based in Nairobi. Um, so I'll just go straight to talking about agriculture. and Why agriculture in, in, in the Nature Conservancy, which is known for environment conservation. Um, the agriculture is, in TNC is a cross-cutting program because it touches on fresh water and forestry, carbon, you know, and indigenous people, lands, oceans, just about everything environment has a connection to agriculture. So agriculture is the main problem. And, and in the previous session, we just had that. And therefore agriculture has to be the solution. Now, in TNC agriculture, we focus a lot on people, soil health, land, um, what an excess is, is, you know, we focus on forest margins, as I've explained. But what is the link with, with TNC priorities? There's a clear link between conservation and nutrition. You know, when, when people eat many different kinds of foods, of course, we know they are more likely to get, you know, micronutrients, or nutrients they need to grow well and fight off diseases. I think this was explained. But we're seeing a lot of loss of forest and habitat for indigenous people. This is very costly because then these people have to purchase food on the markets, uh, contrary to what they are used to. And biodiversity, of course, is critical and, and related to all this. We see there is increased loss of you know, um, sustainable dietary diversity as a, as a result of biodiversity loss. And this has to be addressed. And, and TNC is increasingly looking at this issue of biodiversity and dietary diversity because they are closely linked. But more critically, at the moment, what we're doing is, is soil health, particularly looking at the relationship between drop in micronutrients, especially zinc. And we're thinking about you know, not just the relationship between loss of soil health and health uh, and, and human health, but also thinking in terms of the processing, you know, the, the, the whole thing of soil, um, of, of, of food systems, not just soil. We're thinking, what does soil health loss mean in terms of the health systems? And there's a huge connection in that. But also fresh, fresh water um, is a big issue here because fresh water systems degradation, particularly water, which is an essential nutrient, is very, very huge. And agriculture and TNC is focusing a lot on freshwater systems. And of course, the connection with oceans and, and, and how ocean degradation leads to heavy metals and other contaminants entering the food system. But perhaps more important here, instead of going through all these issues of the connections, is to talk about what, what, what we want to do. You know, what is the, the nutrition lens here at TNC? So number one is the statistical and qualitative evidence that we need, particularly the relationship between the extent of malnourished and loss of soil health, particularly in Africa. 
we need to look at the evidence that connects all these dots, hmm? connection between regenerative food systems particularly and improved nutrition. We need to develop better objectives because you know, as you realize objective building is, is very important and, and TNC is a science organization. We do our, you know, our work based on science. And, and evidence is, is critical for us, but we also need to ensure that we go beyond the normal conservation agriculture, for example, we're doing to include much more, you know, in connections with say legumes, the role of legumes in food systems and, and all that. We need to strengthen status of nutrition through both ex situ and in situ conservation and influence policies and raise awareness. So, you know, um, Awareness is, is, is important, as you know, and we need to be very, very critical, you know, in, in what we do, because if we improve, you know, the, the awareness of so many people, and therefore a lot of people will be interested in the connection between conservation, agriculture, and nutrition. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, building upon the uh, words of the previous uh, speakers, um, as International Food and Agriculture Bank, Rebel Bank, we always have been driven to protect and improve the food production by farmers. And that's why we introduced ACORN. ACORN is an acronym and stands for Agroforestry Carbon Removal Unit for the Organic Restoration of Nature. And to the topic of this uh, discussion, it's inclusive. It's addressing climate equity, as mentioned already by Kim Starkey, that is specifically targeted at smallholder farmers in developing countries uh, that suffer most from climate change. With current projects that we have, for instance, in East and West Africa and Latin America. And what we do is we unlock the voluntary carbon market for those smallholder farmers. The smallholder farmers were not able to join those markets because of the high cost of certification and the high cost of monitoring. The voluntary carbon market is a quickly growing market with reaching volumes of more than a billion in this year. With more corporates making net zero pledges to compensate their unavoidables, this is a potential income stream for those farmers. With 80% of the revenues of those carbon removal units, we also make it, to the second topic of this discussion, a sustainable business case for the farmer that has the potential to earn an additional 20 even with rising carbon prices to 60% on its annual income. And with our ambition to serve 50 million farmers, this unlocks billions to invest in agricultural systems in the global south. But the voluntary carbon markets are only a means to an end. And this uh, overall objective is to support those smallholder farmers to improve their farming practices, to be climate smart, cli climate neutral, and that's where the beauty of agroforestry comes in. By combining trees with animal crops or trees and animals, it inherently drives diversification. At the farmer level, this is enhancing the soil quality. It makes the farmer more resilient to climate change, with, for instance, shadow trees protecting coffee or cocoa uh, uh, trees, or farmers that start planting next to their maize uh, produce, avocados or citrus. And that to the topic is bringing the real diversification of the nutrition of those farmers and ensuring higher quality nutrition. That's also why in our monitoring, we have embedded uh, the dietary uh, index as one of the key performance indicators. We always work together with local partners and as this is an exposed uh, carbon removal units are also open to explore uh, financing opportunities. We truly believe that by unlocking this voluntary carbon market, we also uh, can uh, combat the climate change, combat land uh, degradation, increase food security, and most importantly, make the smallholder farmer benefit of a better diet. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Jimmy Betcher with Partners in Food Solutions. Um, we were founded actually 13 years ago at a similar uh, side event discussion uh, between Kofi Annan and the uh, brand new CEO of General Mills, uh, Ken Powell. 
Kofi challenged Ken, uh, telling him, you're the CEO of one of the world's leading food companies. What are you doing about food insecurity and malnutrition in Africa? Ken said, I don't really have a great answer to that. I don't know. Um, but he gave, gave Kofi a commitment that he would come back in one year with an answer. Uh, so he put together a team that started looking at ways that General Mills could help support uh, solutions in this area. That team had a couple lightning bolt moments early on. Uh, one was that the greatest asset that uh, a big company um, with 150 years of experience had uh, to help support solutions addressing nutrition and, and food insecurity was actually expertise. It's human capital. Uh, and that expertise could be shared remotely. The second um, big lightning bolt moment early on then uh, in an era where tons of work was being done to strengthen agriculture uh, was that if you could strengthen food companies, uh, let's say an entrepreneurial cereal miller in Zambia uh, or a dairy company in Kenya, uh, in the middle of the value chain, you could have a dramatic ripple effect across the entire system, um, creating jobs, creating stable markets for what local smallholder farmers are producing, uh, but really ultimately uh, helping those, those entrepreneurs, those food companies deliver safer, more nutritious food to market locally. Uh, so General Mills ended up um, spinning off uh, the idea and inviting some like-minded companies uh, to join in a coalition to share expertise with entrepreneurial food companies across Sub-Saharan Africa, Partners in Food Solutions. Uh, so our work involves leveraging an expert network of over 1,300 uh, employees of those uh, seven corporate partners that are volunteer consultants, um, and they come alongside and share remote technical assistance and consulting engagements with talented local entrepreneurs across 11 plus markets in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, helping them to support whatever might be the, the biggest barriers to growing their business, particularly with a focus uh, as it regards to this conversation on food safety, quality, nutrition, fortification, really compelling important issues locally. Um, so fast forward to today, 13 years later, we've worked with over a thousand clients uh, who have over 1 million smallholder farmers in their supply chains uh, and have helped them to deliver 50 billion safer, more nutritious meals uh, to market. But the work is certainly not done uh, and there's a continued need for expertise and resources to strengthen these entrepreneurs. So uh, in the next three years, PFS commits to working with 200 of the highest potential food companies across Sub-Saharan Africa, building a cohort, connecting those uh, entrepreneurs with the uh, resources, capital, uh, and partnerships needed to meet their holistic needs, all with the ultimate goal of building a thriving and sustainable food industry across Africa, where all people have access uh, to safe and nutritious food. Thanks. Um, thank you, everyone. My name's uh, Lawrence Haddad. I'm the executive director of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. And it's fantastic to hear about these uh, really exciting uh, and inspirational commitments. And I, I've been working on the UN Food System Summit and N4G for the last couple of years. Uh, and it's clear from looking at these three big summits this year that nutrition, nature, and COVID are inextricably linked. Now, now much of the energy political and financial is currently with COVID and climate, and rightly so. And that, that won't change in the short to medium term. And so nutrition really has to engage with these two envelopes of opportunity, not to drain them, but actually to enrich them. So on COVID, we haven't talked much about COVID, but on COVID, good nutrition is, is the vaccine's best friend, right? Good nutrition wards off a whole host of infectious and chronic diseases that COVID loves to have as a partner in crime to inflict its havoc. And so nutrition promotion and malnutrition prevention should be a default component of every COVID strategy. Now on nature, we've heard Kim and others, the Nature Conservancy talking about how important nature and nutrition is. For nature, promoting healthy diets, reducing nutritious food loss, increasing diet diversity. These are all ways of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, promoting the slowdown of biodiversity loss. It turns out the nutrition 
is the environmentalist's best friend too. So in short, 2021 has to be the year we stop thinking we have the luxury to deal with these issues separately. And Kim put it really, really well. We, we can't deal with either of them unless we deal with both of them. And we never did have this luxury of dealing with them separately. And on that note, just last week again, we hired our first ever environmental lead. So finally, thinking about what, what is the special role of philanthropy? You know, you guys, you're the unfettered pioneers. You can, as Jude, uh, Judith Rodan said, ex-president of the Rockefeller Foundation, you can, as she said, peel back the first layers of risk for the rest of us. You can, for example, uh, just as Kim told us about King Philanthropy, you can work across the sectors. Food is at the nexus of climate and nutrition. Let's make COP27 and COP28 a really a food COP. You can inject fresh perspectives, fresh hope, and fresh energy into issues that seem really difficult and really intractable. Wasting, for example. CIF and ECF are doing so much to invigorate that space. Anemia for women and young children. Kirk Philanthropy, BMGF are doing so much to invigorate that space. You can do the unthinkable. Roy mentioned the work on the true value of food. And I hope, Roy, you're gonna connect the procurement work to the true value of food. Because if we can get some of the procurement guided by the true cost and true benefit of food, then that really is an amazing proof of concept. You can engage with the private sector in ways that some other funders can't. You can incubate, for example, startups, especially young entrepreneurs, young nutrition entrepreneurs, just like the IKEA Foundation is doing. And you can de-risk nutrition finance. Uh, ECF is doing that on impact investing funds, such as the nutrition, Nutritious uh, Food Financing Facility. And finally, you can connect to innovation in ways that many others can't. And one example is Google Foundation's engagement with the food system dashboard. So you guys, you, you're the catalysts. You can take the calculated bets that need to be taken to meet the 2030 goals. Ending malnutrition, money is important, yes. And the, and the 1% versus the 45% that Kim mentioned is a travesty, but it doesn't just depend on new money. It depends on new ideas, new networks, and critically new mindsets. And you have them all. You have them individually, and most importantly, collectively. You can help the rest of us become more innovative and transformative. And I'm, I'm so pleased to hear about Stronger Foundations for Nutrition. It feels like we have a strong set of freshly empowered partners to work with. And together, colleagues, we can end malnutrition for good. Back to you, Nima. Thank you, Lawrence, for that. And thanks to all the speakers. What an inspiring session. I've learned so many new things. Soil health and nutrition, uh, leveraging carbon markets, and really young, fresh, innovative entrepreneurial approaches to enrich and nourish the planet and people. Uh, Lawrence, thank you for speaking about how philanthropic dollars can really be used to peel back the first layers of risk along these, the, this continuum of fresh new approaches. Um, with that, I'd like to thank the panel and move on to our next theme for the day. Uh, but before we get to the health systems panel, I, we're, we're going to hear about the profound impact of good nutrition on human health and prosperity. The next speaker is Mafi Wodeku, who is the embodiment of how, with good nutrition, human potential is limitless. As a star soccer player for her country of Togo, Mafiu shows us that nutrition is foundational to athletic achievement and inspires us to think about what greatness can mean for all of us when we start life with stronger foundations for good nutrition. Uh, a reminder, Mafiu will be sharing her thoughts in French. So if you need translation, please use the translation tool at the bottom of your screen. So over to Mafiu. Bonjour, je suis Ediku Mafiu, joueuse de l'équipe nationale du Togo. Tout d'abord, j'aimerais vous remercier de m'avoir invité à prendre parole à cet événement de haut niveau qui se déroule en marge du sommet de la nutrition pour la croissance. 
J'en suis très honorée. Vous devez vous demander pourquoi une joueuse de foot comme moi se réjouit de parler dans une telle rencontre. C'est en raison de mon intérêt pour la nutrition qui tient une place centrale dans ma vie. Comme vous le savez sans doute, une bonne nutrition est le fondement d'une activité sportive saine. Une bonne nutrition est vitale pour nous, les sportifs, et encore plus les sportifs de haut niveau. C'est la bonne nutrition qui nous permet de renforcer notre corps et nos muscles et surtout nous donne de l'énergie pour améliorer nos performances, nous surpasser et aller toujours plus loin. Nos apports nutritionnels sont donc très suivis, surtout en période de compétition. Je crois que c'est un aspect bien connu de la nutrition. D'autant plus que l'on peut trouver plein d'informations sur la nutrition et le sport, très facilement, tant sur Internet que sur les réseaux sociaux. Ce qu'on connaît malheureusement beaucoup moins, c'est l'importance vitale de la nutrition sur le développement et la croissance des enfants, en particulier durant les mi premiers jours de leur vie, de la grossesse à leurs deux ans. L'absence de bonne nutrition durant cette période fait qu'un enfant sur cinq de moins de 5 ans dans le monde n'a pas le droit à un départ équitable dans la vie. Dans mon pays, le Togo, ce sont 24% des enfants de moins de 5 ans qui sont affectés par la malnutrition chronique et seulement 18,6% des bébés de 6 à 23 mois qui ont un régime alimentaire assez diversifié. Pour moi, ces chiffres sont complètement faux. Le futur des enfants ne devait pas être compromis parce qu'ils n'ont simplement pas accès à une bonne nutrition. Je suis heureuse de pouvoir collaborer avec Unit Life pour donner plus de visibilité sur cette maladie. Pour moi, tous les enfants devraient avoir accès à une bonne nutrition et ce, afin qu'ils puissent débuter leur vie équitablement. Pouvoir augmenter ses performances grâce à un bon apport nutritionnel est bien sûr important. Mais face au rôle central que la nutrition joue dans la croissance et le développement des enfants, le futur de nos pays, cela ne fait pas de poids. C'est pourquoi nous devrions tous parler de la malnutrition des mille premiers jours. En parler, c'est lui apporter plus de visibilité. Et c'est seulement avec plus de visibilité que plus de financement pourront aller vers UNIT9, qui est le seul fonds des Nations Unies uniquement dédié à la lutte contre la malnutrition chronique. Je vous invite donc à en parler à vos proches et autour de vous pour que ensemble nous, nous soutenions le travail extraordinaire de Unit Life qui cherche à protéger les enfants contre la malnutrition chronique. Merci. What an inspiring message from a young athlete for us not to compromise the incredible human potential that each and every child possesses. Thank you, Mafi. Um, to harness this young potential, we've heard about how we need to transform food systems, but together with that, we need to urgently strengthen and integrate nutrition into the health system so that we can ensure that no one's potential or worse their life falls through the cracks, especially during the first thousand days when from conception to when a child turns two. So our second theme for today is on integrated health service delivery. Um, you know, nutrition relies a lot on strong foundations of universal health coverage, uh, and we need to help strengthen the health system by uh, uh, providing a strong foundation of resilience. We also heard, I think, Lawrence say, you know, how good nutrition is also uh, a best vaccine and helps to harness the other, other benefits we can accrue from the health system. So in our next uh, session, we will hear about powerful new solutions to challenge philanthropic funding in partnership with national governments and local institutions to deliver life-saving and life-improving services to those whom we cannot afford to leave behind. And we will begin our next session with remarks from Chris Elias, President of Global Development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Chris will be followed by Will Moore, the Chief Executive Officer of the Ellen L. Crook Foundation. Uh, following Will, we'll hear from Neil Badi Shah, Managing Director of GiveWell, and we'll round off the session with Kara Weiss, Chief Executive Officer of CRI Foundation. So over, over to Chris. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Elias, the President of Global Development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. On a personal note, Stronger Foundations for Nutrition actually started over dinner with colleagues at the Global Nutrition Summit in Milan in 2017. Much like today, 
we came together and asked a simple question. What role as private philanthropies can we play in catalyzing change and driving progress on our shared goal of ending malnutrition? The range of commitments today from enabling more nutritious food systems to delivering essential nutrition services through health systems are a real testament to how foundations can strategically invest in evidence-based and high impact investments. As many of you know, at the UN Food Systems Summit earlier this year, Melinda Gates delivered our $922 million commitment to nutrition, the foundation's largest ever commitment to nutrition. We'll continue to share more detail about that commitment in the coming months. But today I'd like to discuss a particular area of focus of our new strategy, which is the prevention and treatment of wasting. For children in the po postnatal period, wasting is the leading risk factor for mortality. And the pandemic has exacerbated these threats with an expected increase of more than 9 million additional children suffering from wasting by 2022. This is why we will be investing holistically in the prevention and treatment of wasting together as, key, as, as the key to long-term sustainable change. We expect to spend at least $120 million on wasting from 2021 to 2025. Our strategy will deliver a renewed focus on evidence generation, innovations in service delivery and therapeutic products, and financing to achieve scale, which is why we are particularly excited about UNICEF's new nutrition match fund, which provides a one-to-one -one match to governments purchasing essential anti-hunger tools like ready-to-use therapeutic food. After just six months, demand has already exceeded expectations. In fact, six African countries have already committed enough of their own resources that the existing funds are almost entirely exhausted. These commitments illustrate how powerful it can be when international and domestic resources and leadership are aligned. It's evidence that countries will finance high impact cost effective intervention, even when resources are constrained, and that it's on us to help those resources go further. So I'm pleased to announce today that we intend to join the fund's original investors, the Children's Investment Fund Foundation and the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office to contribute an initial sum of $10 million to the fund. This is in addition to our $922 million nutrition commitment. With our contribution, we aim to expand the fund's product offering to include maternal nutrition products, such as balanced energy protein, and multiple micronutrient supplements to improve women's health, improve birth outcomes, and prevent acute malnutrition. We know this won't be enough, and we'll continue to look for ways to do more. But we also hope that other philanthropies will join us in helping countries to scale these life-saving interventions. Solving our global nutrition challenges won't be easy. But investing in nutrition can be straightforward for any funder looking to develop real impact with their resources. I'm excited for what's ahead, and I want to sincerely thank all of you for your participation today and in the days ahead. We're grateful for your partnership and commitment to this important work. Thank you. Malnutrition is a child's worst enemy. Even in a good year before COVID, malnutrition was responsible for half of child deaths globally. Today, a child dies of malnutrition every 11 seconds. And folks, we're really not doing much at all to even try and keep these kids alive. Services aren't there. If we can send billionaires into space, we can stop kids dying from malnutrition. If we can all connect today around the world on our personal supercomputers in real time, like it's no big deal, we can ensure our mothers and our children have access to the basic nutrients they need to survive. But here we are, and child deaths from malnutrition are going up, not down. The world 
the global health community, even the nutrition sector. We've long chosen to focus on other problems. It's time to change that. It's time to get angry. Why are we spending trillions each year on weapons of war when a tiny fraction of this could end hunger and malnutrition, one of the greatest drivers of war? Why are we spending billions each year to return to the moon and to colonize other desolate rocks in the solar system while children still die preventably from malnutrition right here on this fertile planet? It's time to make our voices louder and it's also time to get focused. Nutrition is not just about system strengthening and capacity building and more summits and multi-sectoral plans. It's about delivering real life-saving services to people who need them. For a long time, I think our sector has forgotten that. And I'm glad that we're now beginning to remember. Some of the commitments being made at this session are a testament to that. For decades, we've known how to prevent and treat deadly malnutrition in a cost-effective way. Things like prenatal vitamins for pregnant women, support for breastfeeding mothers, vitamin A supplementation for young children, and treatment with therapeutic foods so that malnourished kids don't die. These are known as the power four, and they're among the most cost-effective interventions in public health. An analysis by Johns Hopkins found that scaling up the power four in just nine countries would reduce child deaths globally by almost 10%. With this, the nutrition sector could lead the next chapter of the child survival revolution. It's time to scale these interventions up. Each of these powerful interventions must be integrated into routine health systems. And new innovations ensure that they can be effectively delivered by community health workers. From a live save standpoint, these are the most cost-effective interventions that the nutrition sector has to offer. And it's time to bring them to the world. For our part, the Eleanor Crook Foundation will deploy at least $50 million over the next few years to help bring the power forward to scale. We're supporting the WHO guideline review on child wasting to ensure that countries have the practical guidance for scale up that they need. We're providing UNICEF with additional capacity to finalize a costed global response plan to wasting. And we're providing them with further resources to launch a global campaign to fund that plan. We're continuing to support researchers and NGOs to work alongside UNICEF and WHO and ministries of health in order to generate evidence at scale. We'll be investing heavily in advocacy at all levels. And finally, we're offering catalytic resources to governments who want to get serious about scaling up power for interventions for their people. Child wasting was the issue that first compelled my grandmother, Eleanor Crook, to commit her personal philanthropy to global malnutrition. For decades, she's ended her own speeches with a quote by an Italian Nobel Prize winner, Salvatore Quasimodo. He said, each one stands on the heart of the earth, pierced through by a ray of sunlight, and in no time, it's evening. Let's get to work. Hi, my name is Buddy Shaw from GiveWell. Um, and at GiveWell, we search for the causes that meet a simple but very stringent set of criteria. Things that are the most cost effective at saving or improving lives and have ready evidence backed and highly scalable interventions. And importantly, are underfunded either by the markets, by national governments, by multilaterals or philanthropies. Uh, and it is a really sad state of the world that acute malnutrition meets these criteria. Based on our research, it seems to be as good of a buy as there exists in saving lives cost effectively in areas where no other funders are fully meeting the gaps. As good as anything in malaria, in neglected tropical diseases, uh, or any of the other tremendous best buys in public health. And as others have stated at this event so powerfully, there are hundreds of thousands of people dying unnecessarily due to malnutrition, while we have low cost, highly scalable programs for, to prevent the, the vast majority of these deaths. And so it really is a mystery why there remain these massive gaps in funding such evidence-backed, cost-effective, and highly scalable programs. 
To this end, GiveWell over the last couple of years has directed over $60 million to vitamin A supplementation. But like Chris and the Gates Foundation, today I wanna to focus uh, our commitments on preventing and treating acute malnutrition and wasting. This year alone, GiveWell has committed $30 million of grants to the treatment of severe acute malnutrition via ALIMA and the International Rescue Committee. And based on the analysis that's ongoing right now, we believe that these programs can absorb hundreds of millions of dollars per year more um, and potentially even more. And so we're quite keen to learn from others in the space and to directly fund the delivery of life-saving programs in the coming years. And so we look forward to learning from others and working with others on how to best prevent these unnecessary deaths, enable more people to lead their fullest lives. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Kara Weiss with CRI Foundation. Thank you for having me today. I feel quite humbled to be speaking to such an esteemed group about such an important topic. CRI is a small private foundation focused on health in Sub-Saharan Africa. We're an evidence-based funder and we employ and collaborate with a wide network of economists to inform our work. Health is a huge sector with a lot of need. So why nutrition, we're often asked. As we all know, nutrition is one of the most cost-effective approaches to health improvement. And frankly, it might be one of the most cost-effective areas for philanthropic investment generally. But nutrition is itself a huge space and the causes of malnutrition can feel enormous and immovable. And if I'm being frank, I think the driving causes of malnutrition, poverty and the broken global food supply system are going to take years, if not decades to fully address. But in the meanwhile, we have cost-effective solutions to prevent and treat malnutrition now. The most, the most obvious one is the provision of ready to use therapeutic food. For years, many actors on the ground have been stocked out and unable to help the kids who need it most. The result is that millions of kids are unnecessarily suffering and dying. This gap in product supply is completely preventable and solvable. And it's time for philanthropy to step up and help fill the gap. In late 2020, CRI tested the waters and bought nearly a million dollars of RUTF from Adesia to stock a number of NGOs in our portfolio. For years, they had been stocked out, despite promises that the supply would come. This donation enabled these data-driven organizations to work with local and national governments to help craft new policies concerning community-based treatment of malnutrition. This year, we've already committed $1.2 million to MANA to purchase RUTF for actors on the ground, leading the charge on evidence generation of best practices of community-based treatment of malnutrition. And we're not stopping there. We're going to be doing several million dollars more to MANA to get more badly needed RUTF out to malnourished kids. And we're going to be investing millions more in research to figure out how to get other solutions scaled. We're hoping to see major gains in the distribution of small quantity lipid supplements to prevent malnutrition among at-risk babies and kids. And we're hoping to better understand the power of other piloted in innovations as well. For example, there's preliminary evidence coming out of Zambia that merely providing educational growth charts, which are next to free, to poor families with young children can prevent stunting by rates of up to 30%. These are the kinds of solutions we need to come together on. We're excited and we're feeling the urgency. Thank you for having me today and I hope to see you out there. Thank you very much to all our speakers for those inspiring words and powerful commitments. I think it is true, as Bill says, this is a time for us to get angry, to really think about those Martians looking down at us from outer space and wondering what we're doing. It is a time for us to really roll up our sleeves, get to work and deliver those proven solutions, cost-effective solutions that we know we have and really lead the next chapter of the child survival revolution. So thank you all for those words. Um, I'd like now to turn to our final speaker on this theme, Carol Karuchu, the Vice President of Programs at the End Fund. Carol will talk to us about the power of integrated programming for global health 
and describe the potential of pooled philanthropic funding models, which have helped transform the landscape for deworming. Over to Carol. Hello, my name is Carol Karutu, Vice President of Programs at the End Fund. The End Fund is a leading philanthropic vehicle dedicated to improving equity, health, and well being in the world, in our case, by ending neglected tropical diseases. To achieve this audacious goal, we must collaborate not only within our sector, which is the health sector, but across many other sectors that intersect with neglected tropical diseases. And none is more important in this regard than nutrition. When a child's belly is full of worms, these parasites steal the nutrients from any food consumed and with them any hope that that child will achieve her full potential. In Africa alone, there are over 600 million people at risk of at least one neglected tropical disease. Through noble winning research, we have proved that an adult who is dewormed regularly as a child will learn more in their adulthood. We know that a girl who is dewormed at an early age has much greater chance of reaching secondary education than a girl who is not, and we all know the benefits of that. For deworming to have its maximum impact though, it has to be offered as part of a comprehensive integrated package of services. And today I am delighted to tell you about a new collaboration that will do just this. The End Fund has launched a partnership with Power of Nutrition, UNICEF, Action Against Hunger, and the Federal Ministry of Health in Ethiopia to integrate deworming into nutrition programming. This will ensure that young children and mothers at risk of parasitic worms receive the treatment we all believe they deserve but have often missed out on. By 2025, this collaboration will help deliver deworming medication to 2.5, 2.3 million young children under two years of age for the first time. It will also improve the treatment of 10.5 million preschool children and 5.8 million pregnant women. These are groups that have historically received inconsistent treatment at best. We have been able to bring these partners together for the first time by leveraging the platform of our Deworming Innovation Fund, which was born out of TED's audacious project in 2019 and supports two countries, including Ethiopia, to fast track the elimination of parasitic worms. This integrated six-year collaborative fund has brought several philanthropies together in the service of this bold vision with a common understanding that cross-sector integration is the only way to achieve success. Indeed, recent research from the, economics, from the Economist Intelligent Unit suggests that if parasitic worms are eliminated by 2030 in the four deworming innovation fund countries, which are Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, and Zimbabwe, these countries will add over 5 billion US dollars to their economies. Though the economic impact of our collective effort is only one small measure of why we are here today, it is nevertheless an important one in making the case for more investment and showcasing the impact of collaborative philanthropy at its best. I am particularly glad to share this news with you. This critical event has brought together some of the most innovative and influential leaders who make our shared goals become a reality. For the gains we make to be sustainable, we must create more space for local solutions and be at the forefront of how we drive lasting change. We need to think and operate differently. And most importantly, we need to listen closely and respond to our government partners with the support they need to achieve their goals in the support of their people. Collaborative funds that pool resources and improve access to critical commodities and services where they need it most is what our world needs today. Thank you all for playing your part and for what we will all do together in years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Carol, for reminding us that um, we need that partnerships and commitments are important to achieve audacious goals and for each of us to really be responsive and play our parts in um, bringing an end to malnutrition. Solving malnutrition may not be easy, but it is certainly wise. 
uh, across the food and health systems all over the world, we know that a step change is needed in funding to truly transform the nutrition narrative and landscape. The 2021 Global Nutrition Report estimates that for, the, for, for just four of the specific World Health Assembly targets, breastfeeding, anemia, stunting and wasting, more than 10 billion US dollars is needed in new resources. And this is just a subset of the broader estimated annual gap of $50, million, $50 billion. We know we won't get to mobilizing these billions of dollars and new resources through business as usual, and we need true innovation. So in our final theme for today, uh, innovative models of investment to transform nutrition at scale, we will hear from a diverse set of speakers who will highlight innovative financing models. The session will be opened by Philippe Juste Blasey, former Under General, uh, Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Special Advisor on Innovative Finance. Uh, Philippe is now the president of Unit Life. Philippe will challenge us to think bigger about what is possible based on the broader success we've seen in global health. Philippe will be speaking in French. So once again, if you need translation, please look for the little globe icon. Over to Philippe. Bonjour, je m'appelle Philippe Douste-Blazy, je suis président du conseil d'administration du Dit Life, qui est un fonds dédié aux Nations Unies, qui est dédié à la lutte contre la malnutrition chronique. J'ai été ministre de la Santé, des Affaires étrangères, secrétaire général adjoint des Nations Unies, en charge des financements innovants pour le développement, auxquels je crois beaucoup. Et d'ailleurs, j'ai créé la première organisation basée sur les financements innovants qui s'appelle UNITED en 2006. Je voudrais remercier ici, tout d'abord, la fondation Bill et Melinda Gates, mais aussi Strongers Foundation for Nutrition. Et euh, merci encore d'organiser euh, ce bel événement. Vous savez, je suis persuadé depuis toujours de l'importance, bien sûr, de l'aide publique au développement pour lutter contre le changement climatique, contre les épidémies, contre la faim dans le monde, contre, bien sûr, la malnutrition chronique. En France, nous avons pensé très vite que les financements innovants seraient une des clés du XXIe siècle si on veut être au rendez-vous de l'aide publique au développement. Le ministère de l'Europe et des affaires étrangères, euh, aujourd'hui coordonne euh, le groupe euh, leader, le Leading Group for Innovative Financing for Development. C'est euh, extrêmement important pour nous, et moi je l'ai compris tout de suite, puisque en 2006, j'ai pensé qu'il fallait trouver de nouvelles sources de financement si nous voulions continuer à euh, donner de l'argent aux pays pauvres. Regardez aujourd'hui avec le Covid, avec les dettes que tous les pays occidentaux ont, parce qu'ils ont déversé beaucoup d'argent pour leur pays, eh bien, si on ne trouve pas de nouvelles sources de financement, on n'arrive pas, on n'arrivera pas à être au rendez-vous. Personnellement, j'ai créé en 2006 avec le président Chirac, UNITED, c'était basé sur une simple idée, un euro ou un dollar qui s'ajoute à chaque billet d'avion. C'est totalement indolore pour ceux qui prennent un billet d'avion, et c'était pour lutter contre le sida, la tuberculose, le paludisme, essentiellement pour diminuer le prix des médicaments. Nous avons récolté comme cela en 10 ans plus de 5 milliards de dollars. Nous avons permis de diminuer le prix des antirétroviraux contre le sida chez les adultes de 50%, chez les enfants de 80%. Donc on a montré que ça fonctionnait. Uniquement 10 pays ont accepté, malheureusement, euh, cette micro-taxe, micro-contribution micro obligatoire sur les billets d'avion. Aujourd'hui, nous avons lancé, il y a plusieurs mois, un an, Unit Life. Euh, C'est une organisation qui est euh, abritée par UNCDF à New York, dans le conseil d'administration, on trouve ONUFAM, la France, et, et, ben, et aussi les Émirats Arabes Unis qui nous aident beaucoup. Euh, de quoi s'agit-il 
Il s'agit de lutter contre la malnutrition chronique. Mais avec quel argent Nous souhaitons mettre des micros, demander aux citoyens des micro-contributions volontaires lorsqu'ils achètent de l'e-commerce, lorsqu'ils achètent de l'art ou lorsqu'il y a des événements sportifs. Une micro-contribution de quelques centimes de dollars, ça ne coûte rien, c'est un dollar, mais au niveau mondial, ça peut faire beaucoup. Alors pourquoi tout cela Parce que la malnutrition chronique, qui est une maladie totalement silencieuse, que personne ne connaît dans le grand public, est une maladie qui est le plus grand fléau euh, aujourd'hui, qui touche plus de 160-165 millions d'enfants de moins de 5 ans. C'est la menace existentielle de l'humanité avec le changement climatique. C'est une maladie qui ne permet pas aux enfants d'avoir leur plein potentiel. Ça touche le potentiel humain et essentiellement, bien sûr, un enfant sur trois dans les pays les plus pauvres. Et c'est terrible parce que ce sont des pays qui ne pourront pas prendre leur, leur potentiel pour sortir de la pauvreté parce que les enfants dès l'âge de 10, 12 ans, 15 ans, ne comprendront pas ce que dit le professeur, parce que justement, des euh, conséquences cérébrales d'abord jouent à partir de l'âge de 3 ans, de manière ensuite euh, indéfinie. Et, euh, mais également, ce sont des enfants qui sont beaucoup plus malades tout au long de leur vie et qui euh, représentent une grande part de la morbidité des pays les plus pauvres. Eh bien, euh, il faut se battre pour lutter contre la malnutrition chronique. Je fais un appel ici à euh, Stronger's Foundation for Nutrition pour que tous les partenaires privés euh, puissent venir nous retrouver. Je salue ici les hôtels Onomo et son, euh, leurs représentants aujourd'hui sous les Mancol. Merci euh, d'être venu. Il y en a d'autres aussi, il y a Ecobank, il y a d'autres partenaires qui sont venus nous aider. Et donc à tous, merci, bon travail, aidez-nous dans la malnutrition chronique et dans une de life. Thank you, Philippe, for those inspiring words uh, and reminding us that we can break the silence around malnutrition with small contributions of just a dollar each time, which adds up to the billions that we, do, we will need. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce you to Beth Dunford, Vice President for Agriculture. Human and Social Development at the African Development Bank. Beth, we'd love to hear from you about the opportunity you see for the nutrition community as we head next year into the African Union's Year of Nutrition. Over to you, Beth, for initial remarks. Great, well, um, thank you so much. I first wanna thank um, Stronger Foundations for Nutrition for hosting this very important event and all of the energy that all of you and others are bringing to the Nutrition for Growth Summit. We know that this has been a really difficult year. Um, several speakers have, have talked about it, COVID-19, uh, global focus on climate change that is impacting people right now on the ground, especially adversely affect affecting the most disadvantaged. These are big issues uh, that the world is focused on. And we need to make sure that within that, the world is also focused on nutrition. And we see that the African Year of Nutrition in 2022 is a huge opportunity to work with African leaders uh, to prioritize nutrition. Um, it provides the continent with a huge spotlight and a platform to tackle head on the various forms of malnutrition and funding gaps that still exist on the continent. And through African Leaders for Nutrition, uh, the bank will work to support African leaders um, to commemorate the Year of Nutrition on three areas. The first is financing. We know that we need more financing for nutrition. I think it's been well explained, but I think that domestic resource mobilization for nutrition is one of the most important areas where we can really elevate and increase financing dedicated to nutrition. So we know that you know African governments are funding nutrition, but often it's very um, opaque. It's very sort of cross-cutting, hard to determine. So really understanding how we track what is being funded for nutrition, and then also how do we increase it? And how do we get a funding target for nutrition? I think that the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Pro Program, or CADEP, has a, nutrition, has a target of percent of natural resources that are devoted to agriculture. Could we think of something similar for nutrition? It's an idea that I think we'd like to explore with African leaders and the AU going forward. 
Another area is cost-effective evidence-based interventions. This is something that you've heard a lot about today, but I think that you know we've heard about the power four. There are other cost-effective proven interventions in other sectors, water, sanitation, agriculture, social protection, and really working with African governments on a proven set of interventions so that the increased level of funding is actually targeted at the interventions that will make the most impact on the ground. And then the third area is around accountability. Africa's Year of Nutrition has to have accountability for delivering nutrition results on the ground through the Continental Nutrition Accountability Scorecard. And this scorecard is a bank-led digital tool to reinforce commitments by African governments to end malnutrition and promote healthy children by really looking at how we highlight actual results achieved on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. It's, a, it's really inspiring to think about what this next year holds under the, uh, under the leadership of the African Development Bank. Um, I'd also like to invite now Amin Hilal, Strategy Department of the Islamic Development Bank to join us for a brief panel discussion with Beth on the role of multilateral development banks in driving scale. So Beth, um, beginning with you, why has the AFDB decided to scale up its investments in banking on nutrition? Uh, great, well, well, thank you so much. Um, I think that um, we know that uh, our president will be speaking later this week to really announce our commitment to scaling up nutrition going forward. So I don't wanna uh, spoil the surprise, but I do wanna talk about our Banking for Nutrition partnership, which is really looking, you know, the bank is about sustainable development economic agenda. And why do we care so much about nutrition? It's because of the gray matter infrastructure that our president talks about so much, which we know is critical for human development. Um, and it's also a critical for economic development. So we know that over 200 million Africans go to bed hungry every night. And uh, the numbers of wasted children, stunted children, we know it's 59 million stunted children, um, 14 million who are wasted. And we know that Africa is the region in the world where stunting is still going up. Okay, this is, this is something that we have to tackle uh, for, for, for many, many reasons, including economic reasons. So again, um, so the bank is really focused on this being a game changer for African development. And the Banking on Nutrition Partnership um, is supported by the Big Win Philanthropy, the uh, Dangote Foundation with te technical support from Nutrition International. And what this does is really look at how do we unlock the nutrition potential of our investments across a wide range of portfolio across the bank. This is in agriculture, this is in water, this is in social development, et cetera. And we think that we can do more and we have been doing more going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. It reminds me of what a, another friend of mine who works for a big multilateral bank said, we need not just more money for nutrition, but also more nutrition for the money that we're putting out there. Absolutely. So thank you for, thank yeah. you for those words. Um, Amin, let's go over to you. Why is nutrition important to the Islamic Development Bank and how are you mainstreaming nutrition into your established funds today? Yeah, um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, just would like before maybe to answer to thank as well Stronger Foundations for Nutrition for the invitation and organizing the, the events. We're glad to be here and uh, be able to talk about the work we're doing on nutrition. So for, for the Islamic Development Bank and very, I would say similarly to the African Development Bank and it's linked to maybe the, the core business that we, we're doing, what the work we're doing basically and the investment we're doing, um, I would say the nutrition um, uh, sensitive interventions have been uh, financed by the bank since its creation in 1975, and they're mainly our agriculture and health um, uh, sectors that are definitely focused on uh, food systems um, for the agriculture, and I would say uh, for health on um, uh, primary health, uh, maternal and child health as well. So um, we see the importance um, of, of investing in nutrition and we have, uh, I would say, uh, revised our strategies in 2021 to include uh, for uh, the uh, agriculture sector, but as well for the health sector, the nutrition component. So the objective is out of approximately the $11 billion that we invested, let's say for the last five years in agriculture and health, um, to see how we could out of this invest more in nutrition. So 
We revised, for example, our uh, maternal and health, maternal and child health uh, strategy to maternal and child uh, health and nutrition. And for the food security strategy, for example, now it's the uh, food uh, and the nutrition security uh, strategy in the bank. So coming to the funds that uh, we launched and the initiative that we have already existing, but continue to invest, for example, in nutrition and looking at nutrition for the next years, uh, we have the Lives and Livelihood Fund uh, when mentioning the fund. So this um, this fund was launched with the Bill uh, and Melinda Gates Foundation, but as well with the Saudis, the Qataris, um, the uh, Abu Dhabis, uh, FCDO, but as well the Islamic Fund uh, for uh, Development um, in 2016. So the objective was really to work on innovative finance and how can we unlock additional, uh, I would say, public spending for uh, social oriented projects. Uh, like nutrition. So what we worked on is to have a pool of grants, uh, 500 million provided by our donor partners uh, that we blend basically with $2 billion of ISDB financing to increase the grant element uh, of, of the funding and the support we're giving to the government. Um, and um, we, we see a lot of success. Uh, for example, in this model, uh, there is uh, a lot of projects that have been uh, financed around uh, nutrition sensitive, but as well nutrition specific activities uh, today, for example, in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, but as well in the Sahel region and uh, Pakistan and other countries of, of membership of the bank. So this is one of the models that is looking at uh, increasing public spending in these sectors. Uh, I can mention as well the Global Muslim Philanthropy Fund uh, for Children that we created with uh, UNICEF in 2018. Uh, that is working on the same model, but more on uh, Islamic social finance and how we can attract and use Islamic social finance for increasing funding uh, for social projects and nutrition, for example. Thank you, Amin, um, for those for those inspiring words and sharing how nutrition can get better integrated into both agriculture and health systems and really unlocking those two systems to deliver for nutrition. Uh, both, to both Beth and Amin, uh, as multilateral banks, and in keeping with the theme of today's um, session, why do you believe partnerships with the philanthropic community are important to help catalyze further scale? And in what ways can that benefit the most vulnerable? So Beth, maybe we start out with you. And in the interest of time, if we can you know, have some crisp responses from you and then hand over to Amin for a minute or so. Over to you, Beth. Great, thanks a lot. I think that you know, again, nutrition is is such a big problem that it, it's one of it's one where we need many many actors. And I think that you know, as as my president likes to talk about, it's it's a bail bag, bail bag project where you need many many arms around the table. I mean, through our um, through our banking on nutrition, and since our our multi sectoral action plan came into being in 2018, we've put 2.5 billion um, in into nutrition sensitive projects. And that's 18% of our products, but it's not enough. We need to really, really grow this so that more of the funds at the African Development Bank are actually delivering on nutrition. And I think for us, you know, that really looks at identifying interventions with greater, greater impact um, across the portfolio and really increasing the production and consumption of nutritious food. And then our work to really advocate with African leaders. And with this three-pronged approach, we can't do that as effectively unless we have philanthropic partners with us. As has been mentioned many times before, philanthropic partners are drivers of innovation, um, catalysts for collective action. And we really need that, as has said, been said before, to peel back the first layer of risk. And I think that when we look at, um, you know, Big Win Philanthropy, just to give one example, has worked with the bank to identify more opportunities for integrating nutrition in the bank portfolio and really expanding the percentage of what we've done to be nutrition sensitive. And the Dangote Foundation, uh, for, to provide another example, has provided a key role in strengthening interministerial agriculture nutrition working group in Nigeria. These are two ways that foundations have really come in to dramatically accelerate impact and scale on the ground. Thank you. Great, thank you, Beth. I mean, over to you, why are philanthropic dollars important and how, what, what role do you see them play? Yeah, I, I will. I, I will maybe answer on two sides. First, for the I would say, for the perspective of the philanthropic um, organization, I think partnering with the MDBs has a, a specific interest. So the core, the core work we're doing is to support our governments uh, basically by financing them. 
So we have a privileged access to our government. And we basically finance the programs of our government. By working with us, I would definitely say that the philanthropic organization has create an access to direct discussions with the government and direct support to the privileged or priority programs of the government. So this is, this is extremely interesting uh, in the sense that uh, we bring them to the table of discussion in that sense. In, in the other sense, I think that uh, if you talk about the dollars of philanthropic organization, for example, a scheme like the LLF or the one we're working on for the one, first thousand days fund that we're launching with uh, WFP and uh, uh, Power of Nutrition, uh, the objective is to create more blending finance. So blending finance uh, increase the grant element, potential grant element of the financing and increase and unlock, I would say, public spending in uh, social sectors like nutrition. So I would say it's a win-win it's a, it's a partnership, non-traditional for us, very, very frankly. I mean, we're used to work more with bilateral agencies than with uh, philanthropic organizations, but we're really happy to, to, to work more on that uh, through our different initiatives. Great. So thank you, Beth and Amin, for those, you know, for showing us how multilateral banks are scaling proven interventions, but using philanthropic dollars in a catalytic way to be responsive to government needs, to look at accountability, and to build, as Akina Deshina says, you know, gray matter infrastructure. Absolutely. And that's the way that we can all come together to end uh, malnutrition. So thank you very much for your time today and for being with us. Uh, let me now turn to our final set of speakers for the day. We have a great roundup. Uh, Etherin Cousin, the founder of Food Systems for the Future and former executive director of the World Food Program, followed by Suleiman Cole, chief operating officer of Onomo Hotels. Kim Cernak, the managing director of Eleanor Crook Foundation, who will speak along with Mike Silobitz, vice president and head of America's publishing for the gaming company, PUBG. And they will be followed by Tom Toffeson, Chief Strategy Officer of Rotary International. Etherin, over to you to kick off this session. Thank you very much. And thank you for this opportunity to participate in this very important conversation. When I was the executive director of the World Food Program, because there was no resilience of food systems in too many of the communities we served, too often, every season, we were feeding the same families and providing critical nutrition support to the same families. WFP, during my tenure and still today, moved from saving lives to changing lives. Yes, increasing safety net programs is quite critical to improving global nutrition outcomes. But global economic development history tells us government programs alone will not create the sustainable, durable solutions required to create long-term change. We need functioning food systems. And SMEs and small farmers make up the bulk of the food system in develop, developing and emerging countries. Private sector capital has historically shied away from food system investments in these markets, offering consistent reasoning that companies are not investment ready because the modest need, the companies have only modest needs, that they have limited collateral and arguably uncertain growth prospects. Couple this together, the creating a situation where it is difficult for asset managers to cover deal creation or identification and challenging to deliver risk-adjusted return to investors. So after leaving WFP three years ago with support from BCG, Stanford University, and a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation, we performed an in-depth landscape study where, and we stood up food systems for the future. Food Systems for the Future is designed as an innovative nutrition impact finance facility because overcoming this, these challenges that I've described is beyond just funding. FSF is divided into two parts, the nonprofit institute and a for-profit social enterprise for advisory facility. This organizational structure was created to overcome the identified challenges, funding through grant capital to perform the wraparound services, specifically advocacy, the, the, the creating the policy and the regulatory ecosystem for partnership and nutrition impact and outreach for ideal, for deal creation and nutrition evaluation and monitoring. That's that impact work that 
is funded by grant capital. This allows the Institute to maintain talented individuals specializing in these fields. But with the assistance of thought leaders at Stanford, rather than partnering with a financial management firm to, some would argue, move faster, we stood up the FSF LLC inside of the Institute with an eye towards creating an in-house track record for deal creation and capital deployment. After a year of unsuccessful conversation and with the advice and support from S2G, the largest food system VC in the US and Rabobank, we built an operating model supported by experienced finance talent, including a seasoned finance expert as chief investment officer buffered by an in-house investment committee. Because as COVID illuminated the problem of malnutrition are not just problems in the developing world, but also the developed world, the FSF LLC, supported by two separate teams, is now operating in the US and Rwanda to initially ambitiously raise two relatively small proof of concept funds. In the U.S., with grant support from the Walmart Foundation and others for fund design and develop, the Good Food Opportunity Fund will target primarily Black and Latinx SMEs across the agri-food value chain with the goal of addressing the challenge of affordable, nutritious foods in these historically malnourished, underserved communities. In addition to nutrition, the fund in the U.S., We'll also have a deal funnel, which will factor in community job creation. We're targeting a $30 million raise for the first close towards building a fund of $200 million. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the FSF LLC is working to launch the Africa Good Food Opportunity Fund. Recognizing the challenge of adequate access to affordable protein, this, this fund will focus on sustainable protein. While working to identify pipeline companies in Rwanda, working with Rabobank with support from Eleanor Cook Foundation and others, and in partnership with Florida University, as well as the Ministry of Agriculture, even before finalizing the Africa Good Food Opportunity Fund, we identified a challenge to scaling up the poultry value chain. That challenge is affordable feed. To address this challenge, even before raising the fund, we created a joint venture partnership with a Rwanda SME named Afia, a Black Soldier Fly sup feed supplement company. To leapfrog the challenges of others working to harness this potential game-changing solution, we secured an MOU with Protix, a large Black Soldier Fly producer in the Netherlands, as well as Florida University for feed formulation. This solution offers the possibility for substituting BSL, BSFL larvae for soy and reducing the cost of feed, potentially in, increasing the scale of opportunity for the poultry industry and as a result, reducing the cost of eggs. FSF and AFI are now raising grant capital to develop the feed formulation policy and regulatory approvals, the physical facility improvements, to enhance the conditions for scale and growth. A special purpose vehicle, an SPV, is being raised to support the blended capital necessary to perform the investment work. This SPV will become the first asset in the Africa Good Food Opportunity Fund pipeline. In addition to S SPVs in Rwanda, the Africa Good Food Opportunity Fund will begin raising capital in the first quarter of 2022 to support a pipeline of SPV deals across agri-food value chains capable of increasing affordability of sustainably produced proteins in Ghana and Kenya as well as in Rwanda. SF, FSF will seek to initially raise $20 million with the goal of raising $100 million for this fund. We build a track record of capacity to raise, deploy, and manage capital with an impact on nutrition. We have chosen this innovative design to create a facility with the capacity to impact nutrition outcomes while diminishing the risk concerns of private sector. FSF is well aware that a good fund design and experienced fund operators will not overcome the historical challenges of attracting asset owners and managers to join us as LPs for nutrition impact. We will indeed require catalytic capital from foundations, high net worth individuals, and governments to de-risk the capital stack even further through first loss investments. We will also continue raising cap capital for the Institute to support the advocacy work. 
our success and hope is that all of the funds that have been described here today will be successful to help us fill the $4.5 trillion of unmet financing gap in the nutrition space. Those we hope to serve win if we all win. Thank you. Thank you, Esrin, for that. Um, so with those words, let's move to Suleiman Kul, our Chief Operating Officer from Anamo Hotel. Suleiman, over to you. Well, hello everyone. I don't know if you hear me, just for me to make sure that you, you hear me. Okay. So yeah, I was uh, just saying that I'm really privileged and honored to, to represent Onomo in this, in this forum. Uh, we are extremely, I would say, uh, happy to, to be one of the key partners of, of Unit Life uh, on this, uh, I would say, malnutrition, uh, I would say, fight. Because as um, one of the hospitality leading company in Africa, we, we, we think that it is our, our duty uh, to be part of the fight to make sure that, I would say, our key, uh, I would say, children will, will be, I would say, in um, good shape uh, for, for to, 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 to fight against this, this malnutrition, um, I would say, challenge. What we, what we decide uh, since the very beginning, first is to, to have a three years partnership uh, with Unit Life. That's the commitment we took since the very beginning. So we should have, we will uh, take the opportunity to use our different hotels as a platform uh, for this uh, battle against mal malnutrition and uh, use our thousands of clients who are staying in our hotels uh, to make sure we'll be able uh, to inform them and make people aware of this big challenge we are uh, in, in, in front of us for the next upcoming three years. Uh, and we were very happy to collaborate with Unit Life in a very innovative way because the teams are very involved and they will they decide to them since the very beginning to implement a very I would say simple uh, uh, I would say uh, um, uh, what's the name of the landing. the landing page sorry I'm with my team uh, to make our, make sure that our clients will use the landing page to fund and finance uh, this the, for, for unit life to fight against uh, malnutrition. So I would like to, to thank uh, Unit Life and Kusmik, our technical partner on this topic, uh, to help Onomo and, uh, and our teams uh, to change uh, the game on the ground, which is our duty and our commitment for the next uh, three years. Thank you, Suleiman. Hi, my name is Kim Cernak, and I am the Managing Director at the Eleanor Crook Foundation. I'm thrilled to be here today to share more about our campaign, Life Pack. Right now, at least 50 million kids around the world are suffering from wasting, a life-threatening form of malnutrition. Life Pack is a campaign that harnesses the power of Generation Z video gamers to bring life-saving care to kids suffering from wasting. Video games are a $65 billion a year industry in the US alone and they have unmatched reach. There are more than 280 million gamers in the US alone, and 75% of households have at least one gamer. Gen Z makes up a significant portion of them. Almost 70% of Gen Zers see gaming as an important part of their identity. And they are perhaps a more purposeful generation than any other generation that has come before them. More than 75% of Gen Zers report purchasing from brands specifically to support causes they care about. And when asked what issues companies should address, Gen Z prioritizes hunger and poverty. LifePack is a campaign built for this generation. We work with video game companies to build simple in-game mechanisms that can be integrated into gameplay. These activations can take any form gem packs, loot crates, skins and badges, or character customizations. With each life pack microtransaction, a player not only gains a benefit in the game, they also are truly saving a life. 100% of life pack proceeds goes towards the procurement of ready to use therapeutic food. One packet of RUTF three times a day for roughly six to eight weeks can bring a child back from the brink of death. So far, LifePack has provided more than 75,000 days worth of RUTF 
for kids suffering from severe malnutrition. And we are just getting started. In 2022, LifePack aims to reach 1 million kids with life-saving care and inspire the entire gaming industry and beyond to join the fight against global malnutrition. We are joining forces with gaming companies who share our commitment to the LifePack mission and vision. I'm excited to introduce you to one of those partners today. Mike Silbowitz, Vice President and Head of America's Publishing at PUBG. PUBG has already begun mobilizing their gamers and influencers in support of LifePack. We are thrilled to work alongside PUBG and save as many lives as possible in the year ahead and beyond. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, Kim. I'm Mike Silbowitz, head of America's Publishing at Crafton, the creators of the PUBG franchise. We're proud to join forces with LifePack and are committed to an ongoing partnership around their work. When working together on our first streaming event this past September, we realized the importance of the cause and saw the difference we can make together with LifePack and our community. We can't wait to level up our partnership in 2022, and we're looking forward to building out more consumer activations. By engaging the millions of players in our community, we look forward to working together to help put an end to childhood malnutrition and saving lives. Greetings, it's uh, Tom Thorfinson. I'm with Rotary International, and we are pleased to be the newest steering committee member for the Stronger Foundations for Nutrition. You may know Rotary in a very local sense as a club in your hometown. A group of local professionals and business leaders gathered together weekly. However, Rotary is more than just a local club. We are both local in our focus and global in our impact. Your local Rotary Club is just one of 47,000 clubs in over 200 countries worldwide. We have over 1.4 million individuals that are members of those clubs. This local and global aspect of Rotary is best exemplified by our polio eradication effort. For over 30 years, polio eradication has been our top corporate priority. To date, our members have personally contributed over US $2.1 billion to this effort. However, it's our power of advocacy that has been our most valuable contribution. Across the globe, our members have tapped their network to bring together local leaders, regional leaders, and national leaders to fight this disease. We call on local organizations and national governments to join in this effort. But beyond our funding ability and our power of advocacy is our willingness to give of our time for projects at a very local level. A recent analysis by Johns Hopkins revealed an estimated 47 million volunteer hours contributed annually by our members at an estimated value of $850 million. In addition to volunteering our time, through our Rotary Foundation, we award approximately $100 million in grants each year to our own clubs to focus on local needs. Many of these grants, of course, address nutritional needs. The projects vary greatly. In many cases, clubs have joined forces to provide vitamin A supplements and deworming pills. As another example, in over 30 countries, our clubs have helped in the creation of women-owned vegetable gardens. Most importantly, we are proud to be a part of a nutrition effort in Ethiopia in partnership with the Eleanor Cook Foundation together with Power of Nutrition, UNICEF, and the End Fund. Rotary has committed U.S. $2.5 million as part of this $30 million initiative. It's a five-year program to address both malnutrition and wasting. Finally, it is our hope that our participation as a member of the steering committee for Stronger Foundations for Nutrition, we will be a catalyst to more locally focused, innovative interventions. Hopefully, Rotary members will not wait for a Martian to land in order to launch further efforts to fight malnutrition. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Tom. Let me conclude that session and move to our final speaker of the day. 
but real thanks to, to all the speakers right now. We heard about saving lives, moving from saving lives to changing lives. We heard about gaming for nutrition. I did promise you that and harnessing the potential of the next generation and Gen Z. We heard about Rotary International's wonderful work of using local clubs and harnessing the power of volunteerism um, to achieve global impact. So it is truly inspiring and extremely humbling. With that, I'd like to turn to our final speaker of the day, Matt Freeman, who is the Executive Director of Stronger Foundations for Nutrition, the host of today. Matt, over to you for a few words before we wrap up the session and thank everyone. Thank you, Namat, for all of the energy and passion that you've brought to us today. You've left us inspired that this is only the beginning of what is possible. Thank you also to our wonderful speakers for sharing your commitments and helping call all of us to action. Most importantly, thank you to all of you who are watching today. Your attendance is a strong endorsement of how important it is that we all come together to end malnutrition, one of the world's greatest and yet also most solvable challenges. Beyond the funding itself, which though critical we know is not nearly enough, more exciting is the diversity of this community. Across health and food systems, countries and continents, from giving time and small donations to new funding models and asset classes, from institutions investing in these issues for decades to those only just getting started. These commitments show there is real innovation happening and that it's time to start dreaming bigger to truly end malnutrition. Stronger Foundations for Nutrition is building a community to strengthen and scale the impact that private donors can have as advocates, innovators, and change agents in unlocking the true potential of all of us. The Stronger Foundations for Nutrition build stronger foundations for the future. Thank you all, and I look forward to your partnership. Thanks, Matt. Um, how are you feeling? Um, you know, your organization funded or organized, I mean, brought together this interesting panel of speakers. And how do you feel at the end of this two-hour session and the conversations you've heard? It's been an incredible sprint. And also for you, as you've helped us run through all of these speakers. And I feel really proud and excited for what's coming in this community. As I was sharing, it's not just about the dollars that are committed today, it's just the diversity that is most exciting to have representation of all of these great institutions that have given for so long and are giving such tremendous amounts. And then also all of these newer players, many of whom the nutrition community has potentially not heard of before to be able to all be at that same table and think together about what's possible for the future is just very exciting. Great, thank you. So I hear a lot of optimism in how you see the future, is that, can I say uh, that? Absolutely, and I, I hope that's something that everyone takes away. You know, we want to all feel inspired at this moment that with these great challenges of a global pandemic and climate change, that it's possible to actually have hope and see that we can create real change in the world. And I do believe that nutrition is foundational to that. And also that nutrition is so deeply impacted by all of these issues, as Lawrence also said. So I think this is a moment to celebrate. And then in the new year, we'll be getting very busy trying to continue to grow this community and grow our impact. Any highlights for 2022 that you want to share with us before we round up our session? Well, we'll be building campaigns across health and food systems and trying to get all of the philanthropic community and broader corporate community that are interested in working on these issues together. So I would really invite everyone out there, uh, if you have an interest in health, if you have an interest in food or in climate, you should also have an interest in nutrition and there is a seat at this table for you. So please do reach out. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much for you know, bringing us all together for this session. And with that, I'd like to start to conclude and round up um, our conversation for the day. I'd like to thank the amazing set of speakers we had. I'd like to thank all, each and every one of you who joined us and listened in and tuned in. I hope you will participate actively. Uh, I personally am extremely humbled and inspired by the commitments I've heard. 
um, the thought-provoking ideas, you know, gaming, carbon markets, I mean, uh, Rotary International's amazing hours of volunteerism, and I hope you are too, and I think the, the theme of today, new commitments, new partnerships, I think really um, together we can come together and change the narrative for nutrition. So as Kim said, the Martians looking down upon us begin to smile um, and are not dismayed. Um, so with that, thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Stronger Foundations for Nutrition, and thank you for joining us. Over and out. Thank you, Matt.